If you clicked on this video, it's probably because whatever you're doing with your anxiety isn't working. In this video, I'm going to describe the coping strategies that people tend to use that are really just short-term band-aids. And then I'll talk about longer term, more helpful management strategies for anxiety. Hi, I'm Kira Hensley, a registered psychotherapist who helps women who are overthinkers and overachievers manage their anxiety so they can do more of what matters to them. Let's take a look at three short-term band-aids that people tend to use um, for their anxiety. These are things we've all likely tried. Just take a moment and think of all the ways that you try to manage your anxiety. It might be binging Netflix, checking out and binging Netflix. It might be um, using some sort of substance, maybe at the end of the day, a glass of wine, or cleaning, shopping, or maybe even just telling your mind to shut up. <laughs> so how effective are these? Let's take a look at an example. Imagine you had a really stressful day at work or school. You come home and you're worried about how the next day is going to go as well, so your anxiety is pretty high. You make yourself a cocktail, you get your favorite show going on Netflix, and you maybe even shovel a few handfuls of M&Ms as you're watching the show. Anxiety is reduced, you're feeling better. So you do get some short-term relief from this anxiety, but once the buzz wears off and you close Netflix, I'm guessing your anxiety comes right back, especially when you fall into bed, your mind just starts racing again. So you can say that these were effective strategies because it did reduce your anxiety. But think about what it cost you. You put your health at risk with substance use, possible weight gain from food that wasn't particularly nutritious for you, and you've spent an evening disconnected from the people that you love, or maybe from hobbies or something else that you'd want to do. Another way we often try to deal with anxiety is by pushing our thoughts and feelings away. Don't think about it, don't think about it, don't think about it. I've been there, I've done that. And not only is that not a band-aid for anxiety, that's actually like rubbing sandpaper on the wound. There's something called the post-suppression rebound effect. And what researchers find is when we try to suppress our feelings, we still have the physiological indicators of that emotion. So when we compare a group of people who tried to suppress the emotion and people who didn't suppress the emotion, they actually have the same physiological indicators like heart rate that tells us they're both still feeling the same emotion. The only person we're fooling here is ourselves. And even further, we know that the people who tried to suppress the thought actually are better able to recall that thought later on than the people who just allowed the thought and feeling in the moment. This is called the post-suppression rebound effect. The anxious thoughts come right back even more strongly after we've tried to suppress them. A third band-aid people with anxiety tend to use is by controlling other people. It might be micromanaging others. For example, a mother who um, is worried about her own weight might over, um, over control what their child is putting in their mouth. Or we may criticize somebody else about something that we feel anxious about. Or we may withdraw our love from somebody by giving them a cold shoulder when things don't go our way. And again, you can see that in the short term, this helps to reduce your anxiety because everything feels in your control. But in the long term, we can think of the cost to those relationships and maybe even the cost to the other people's um, feelings and mental, their own mental health. So these are the short-term fixes people with anxiety try to use. What are the more helpful longer-term strategies for managing anxiety? Number one is being present. I know this sounds cliche because you've heard it a million times, but overthinkers tend to spend a lot of time beating themselves up for what's happened in the past or definitely worrying about what's going to happen in the future. And this is really not a helpful way for your mind to spend its time. Another word for this is called mindfulness and there are um, a million different ways to do this and I describe a lot of them on my blog. Number two is opening up. Opening up is the opposite of the short-term fixes I just described. 
It's the opposite of suppressing your thoughts. It's the opposite of numbing or distracting. And it's also the opposite of avoidance, which is another way um, people manage their anxiety. A simple exercise for this is just by stopping, breathing, and noticing what your body is feeling on the inside and outside. You'll notice that this exercise and opening up in general is really difficult. Um, people have a hard time accepting that those feelings are there and being with them. So either be really patient with yourself as you're navigating that steep learning curve or maybe get the help of a therapist. Number three is doing what matters. Clients who are overthinkers and overachievers are often stuck in two modes, either avoiding failure or maintaining strict, rigid standards. These actions are driven by fear, fear of being uh, judged as not good enough or fear of being rejected. These fears tell us that being valued and being accepted is important to us. It's kind of obvious, but we don't often think of what our fears tell us about what is important to us. And knowing what matters gives us the option to choose behavior activities that matches our values. So for example, if you value uh, connection with others and new experiences, and you're feeling anxious about going to a party, you be present, you open up, and you do what matters. You go to the party. Or if you're anxious to, about your child's grades and you're micromanaging their behavior around studying, ask yourself what's important here. If it's having a loving relationship with your child and valuing their autonomy, your controlling behavior might be getting in the way. So step back, be present, open up to those really uncomfortable feelings that your child might not do as well in school as you want them to. And do what matters. Set your child up for success and allow them to choose excellence. If you like these strategies and want more, come visit me on my blog at actonanxiety.ca. Thanks for listening.